wanted to say also, about 15 years ago, we sat down, the six of us, and there's a recording the, the county has, was kind enough then to make a recording, but it was outdoors and just couldn't control the quality, and, and that was not successful. But we do have several short clips of the voice, the audio, and maybe it can be incorporated into this, because our memories, all six of us. I'd already mentioned my name. Uh, my first name is my mother's maiden name. And uh, then my father's uh, first name, Ira, is my middle name. And uh, they were uh, residents of Baldwin County. My dad all his life and uh, mother from 1937 on to her death in 1998. Well, I'm Edward and uh, I'm named after my grandfather on my father's side. He was Edwin Preston, that's when he was uh, well known as E.P. Lipscomb or Mr. Ed. He was born and grew up in Baldwin County. And uh, my middle name, Walter, was after one of my father's brothers that died at a young age. And uh, so it, both my names came from my father's side of the family. growing up, but Edward, one of the brothers, farmed most of his life. For a time, he was on a shrimp boat. That was with Uncle George Lipscomb and Rod Lipscomb, and they actually were shrimping in the Gulf. Sheldon's been out there shrimping. It's a hard way to make a living, but it was important here. But through the years along the way, you know, we do know that uh, those memories with the years kind of fade away, but I wanted to mention Edward particularly as well to say because he loved the animals and horses always and I, I know Lawrence, Edward and Claude, maybe Edward and Claude more so were riding horses before I can remember but it was a big thing in its day. Uncle George had horses, we had horses and Edward when he farmed had horses as well. We had Appaloosas back in those days. I uh, rode some and I think I've got a picture here and showed as far as just this was an Appaloosa horse named Squanto and that was about 1972. And this particular horse, and there's an Appaloosa circuit, now Claude and Carol have quarter horses, and they, so forth, but this was just in those years showing and won a high point for performance. But we used them on the farm also, and just nothing professional but roped off of them. A good horse and a good work horse and a lot of good memories. But Edward raised the horses and the cattle, and then later years, as Shella mentioned, farming changed. And it's kind of like you had to have not just the finances, but you had to kind of get larger. There are other factors involved, but Edward took a job off the farm for a number of years. And it's a little unfortunate that Lawrence and Edward can't be here because they remember more of Baldwin County's history, going back in history, Claude and Sheldon, also to a degree. And I, I came in kind of in the later day, but do remember and remember going to Magnolia Springs School. And from Magnolia Springs School, we all went to Foley High School. We have a picture here, the six of us, but it is important. And as we think back over the years, Lawrence, we've mentioned Stockyard, and well, that was an important part of his life, farming as well. Had four sons, he and his wife, and through the years, and they grew up there in Robertsdale, the community in Robertsdale. But also Edward, and Edward farmed in this community uh, right here, close by. He was named after his grandfather, our grandfather, E.P. Lipscomb, and uh, farming was in his blood also, and farmed for many years. We all worked together as a partnership for some of those years, and many good memories. I can't say they all were good, but most were. And in the years growing up, kind of following what Claude said a few minutes ago, I can't say we never argued. I'm not gonna say that but we were never really, I don't know if we were ever mad at anybody. I mean, like, if it was, it was for the moment, and certainly nothing lingering. Unfortunately, too many families are divided over sometimes even small things. Sometimes, obviously, it's money. But with that, just the memories, and Edward did farm in this community, but it's interesting, and I know Claude has more information about even the first house that our family lived in, not this house, but it was near. It's just right down the lane, if you will, the road. Well, first off, though, I'd like to add to what you said about Lawrence and Edward. They were the older brothers of all of us, of course, but they meant a lot to me. And as I grew up and came into the world, they were an example for me. And I, whatever they did, I was wanting to do what Lawrence and Edward were doing. And Edward loved to ride horses more than Lawrence did, but Lawrence did ride though. But 
But Edward and I, were, every chance we get, usually it was a Sunday afternoon, we would take off just the two of us and we'd ride in any direction we could go. We didn't cross Weeks Bay, but, but we did go up one time down to Sunset Shores and go south down the shore. And it was getting middle of the afternoon and we started discussing riding through the swamp to a, our southernmost property. And we discussed, if we go in this direction, certain direction, don't you think we would come out at the Nelson field? And we both agreed. We thought we knew we, the way we could go. So we took off to the east from where we were at the moment. And it was the going was pretty good for a while, just weaving through pine trees and stuff. But then the brush got thicker and the tie dye bushes and, and this belly deep bamboo vine that grows down here. And, those horses got to where they couldn't go uh, 100 feet in you know, 15 minutes or so. And Edward was ahead of me. I was following on my horse. And he'd go one direction a while, and then he'd stop. He'd backtrack, and he'd try a different direction. And so I was watching. We, we were so thick in the swamp, we couldn't see the sun. But I was, I was watching the sky, and it we weren't talking to each other really by that point, but I was beginning to believe that he and I were going to spend the night in that bicycle swamp. And I was, I was about 10 years old, and I, that wasn't a pleasant thought to spend that night out there. But we kept picking our way, and we finally made it through. And and then then we had about three miles to ride to get home, and then had to do feed the animals and all after that. So I'm sure we finished in the dark. But but anyway. Um, on our father, like I mentioned earlier, he lost his mother when he was four and our granddad was so busy. If there's a, ever a workaholic in the world, it was our papa, Ed. Uh, so my dad had a lot of t leeway growing up and he went to school in a little schoolhouse called Kruger Schoolhouse, which it sat about 300 yards from where we're sitting right at the moment. But he went to that school. He was born in 16, and so he went probably four years to this little Kruger schoolhouse, and then they opened the Magnolia Springs School in 1927, and he went up there for a couple of years. And then he was supposed to, since it went through the sixth grade, he was supposed to go to Foley. but. He didn't have a mother to help him do homework. And Papa didn't value education all that much. Although he raised 12 children and those 12 children, he supported at least one of them, Papa did in school for 49 straight years. But dad, he was biding his time to get out of school so he could go full time farming. And, and when he was 16, our granddad had been single for 12 years. He remarried and my dad immediately moved out to a little house that he had, that's a, south of us about 400 yards. So all this stuff is close proximity. But Uncle George and Aunt Ann got married in 1932 and dad was 16. So he had helped Uncle George build this little house and it only cost him $26 to build a house. And when you think about the cost of a home today, but but to explain that, he they own land and they went sawed their own through their own trees and got them to the sawmill, sawed the lumber, and then built a house and they provided all the labor. So the twenty-six dollars they spent was in hardware to build a house. But that's where I started this world and Sheldon too. But he we moved away when Sheldon was about six months old. But I have many memories from that little house. But uh, there was a silo just below there, and we filled it every year with silent corn, chopped corn, and, and it fermented. And we had to, all winter, we had to feed that silage out of that silo. It's still standing down here, but um, just so many memories. Daddy would feed those cattle out, and before the stockyard, then he had to haul them to Mobile, like we said earlier. But, um, 
we were just country boys and personally I would not trade the way I was raised for anything in this either. world. <clears throat> well, we've it was a it. distinct era and it's not it didn't exist before us and it's never going to exist again. It was our period of time. Well, I've said we weren't raised in Mayberry, but it was as close as you get. We weren't in town, obviously, we were in the country, but it was a peaceful time. Not saying there weren't troubles in the world, there were. But when we came along again, we had family, and I remember specifically, didn't ride so much on Sunday afternoons, and it wasn't with Edward and Claude, the younger generation. I did ride when I was in high school some, but I remember on Sunday afternoons, often after church, after lunch, we would go to our granddad's home and just sit on the front porch, and I was a kid and listened to the grown-ups, the adults, talking about what was taking place in the world, but good memories, and our family has been close all these years, still are as we are, and from time to time we get together. There is a picture, I think Claude had mentioned, showed it to us earlier today, of our grandfather, called him Papa, as I mentioned, and Uncle George, Lipscomb, Uncle Fred, and our dad are all on horses. And then Papa and his wife passed away, Charlotte, as mentioned, Carver, when our dad was only four or five years old. There were five children for about 10 or 12 years, as I recall. He was not married, but he did remarry. And I don't have my glasses on, but it was Nettie May Shepherd Mason. And she had three sons. Her husband had passed away. There was Vernon and Robert and Kenny, I believe, those three. And then together, our grandfather and our grandmother, step-grandmother, had five daughters, Ruby and Ruth and Elva and Barbara and Linda. And that's 49, 50 years of public school continuous. So Papa lived kind of a unique life himself. We're he lived to be 92 years old, but his youngest daughter was born when he was 60. 60. And I'm sure he thought he wouldn't be around when she was grown, but she was 32 when he passed away. Right. But this is a picture to put together. Our daughter Mandy lives in England, as I mentioned, there in ministry, there in England, three granddaughters. But she put this together, and this is James Philip Lipscomb on my right, and then our Papa in the middle, and we could talk all afternoon about Papa because he had his own, I would say, opinions, and he, you know, we, I won't get too far into it, but a lot of things we remember that Papa said. I'll give you one example. Papa said he didn't believe they ever went to the moon. He said, you know, they made that out in Hollywood. And I'm not saying the older I get, the more I'm like Papa, but sometimes we do wonder what the truth is along the way. But then our dad, Ira, and then along the way, myself, the youngest, seventh sons, and our son is Daniel Bart, and he lives out in Texas in ministry also. So just a lot of wonderful memories along the way. But that's the family <coughs> that goes back from there. William, and this is going back a generation, was away even in the war, and two sons and a son-in-law, and that's kind of one of the main reasons they left West Central Alabama, and the war was a war between the states, and he came south. Afterward, in later years, he actually moved down here to Baldwin County also. No, I just was saying Daddy owned a lot of land, bought a lot of land. At one time, he had owned 1,400 acres. I think that's correct. I that's bought that. my that's first 40 acres when I was in 11th grade, I turned 17. Well, anyway, he had had 1,400 acres, and the most he paid for that 1,400 acres was $305 an acre. Most of it was $50. Some of it was $5 and $3, but he didn't pay any more for that 1,400 acres. The most he paid was about 60 acres. He paid $305. The rest of it was way less than that. A part of that actually goes back to the times because the depression and the deep depression. I mentioned our grandparents on the Lawrence side moved from Fairhope, Alabama, and they've been in construction, building schools and boats, built the first Fairhope boat that actually went across from Mobile to bring supplies. And back in those days, the waterways were so important. And in our community, there was a grocery store, Vernon Park grocery store. And that's where things were brought to, shipped in and shipped out. And that was true all around. Bond Secure is true in Mifflin. Lots of places, the waterways were so important. But along the way, when the de depth of the depression, you mentioned $26 for that house, that was real money, hard to gather up, $26 back then. 
and even along the way, and Dad came in and grew, and the economy had really been low, so low, the depression. It, the, the land prices had been sort of re reduced and kind of began to climb, and now, you know, it's hard to know, and I'm not saying, and I'm not just pessimistic, but there's a lot of uncertainty in the co economy about the world. And right now, these are different days, I would say, and I think we'd agree, I, we didn't talk about this before, but I think we've seen more changes in the last two years than we've seen in all these years put together in our life. And there is questions about where we as not just a state or a community or a nation, but in the world and, and a lot of things that are happening. I'll say, and I wanted to say this because it's so important we have our dad's Bible. And I can say our grandfather and great-grandfather, our great-grandfather James Philip was actually a member of St. Peter's Church, his Episcopal Church in Bonscure. And so that was the church there. They would go quite a few miles on Sunday to the church. But in the, in the, the 1920s, late 20s, the, a church began in our community, Vernon Park Baptist Church. And then our dad and mom were married in 1937, I think January of that year, if I remember right. And our mother was quite an influence on our dad. And along the way, and Claude mentioned the one characteristic that he was, he was honest and he was just straightforward, always was, and there's not a better way to live your life. But then his Bible, and so the heritage, the Christian heritage that we have, and it does run deep, and the question for each of us, we can't depend on our parents or grandparents' faith. It's personal for each of us and for our children, grandchildren. It's so important, especially in the days today. One last that I would say that fits in my mind and heart is that we just had Holy Week, and that was Easter and celebrated in Easter Resurrection Sunday. But then in the Bible, it's recorded in the book of Acts, 40 days later, after the resurrection, Jesus, and it's recorded, ascended into heaven, and the message then by the angels was that this same Jesus will return in like manner. And when you study all the Bible, the Old Testament, Jesus' words in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13, and the book of Revelation, there's so much scripture that I believe is being fulfilled. We've lived a wonderful life. We've been blessed in many ways. We didn't choose our parents. We didn't choose our country. We didn't choose, we've had more freedom and liberty than most people have ever known or dreamed of in their life. But yet we do know things are changing and that's why God's word and what he said is most important. And it's all laid out as we see many of the Bible promises, prophecies being fulfilled. But it is our Christian heritage, and as we think of this, we're grateful. It's not just closing this out, but I wanted to say that because to me it's the most important, and I think we would all agree this is God's Word. You know, a while ago we've been talking about how honest Daddy was, but there was a man in the community that uh, he said, I can't deal with Ira Lipscomb, said he's too blame straight. <laughs> That's he's a good criticism. Straight. That's a good criticism if you have some. Yeah, we, uh, okay, we, was, we grew up in, in, with it in the family. Daddy took us to church regularly, uh, mother and daddy, and, and we all grew up going to church uh, with, with them. And uh, as, a, as a young man, I can remember going, uh, <clears throat> and the air con building wasn't air conditioned. It was a plain country building, but uh, our great uncle, was instrumental in starting the church and he gave property for it. Uh, there was already a cemetery there that had been there since about 1855. There was a, a guy on a boat that had, we talked about boats coming in on the river had passed away and nobody knew who he, somebody knew him, but no, they didn't have a family, but they buried him here and his identity was lost during time. And, uh, but then they started using it as a community cemetery and then it had been used as a community cemetery for about 30 years and then uh, the church was started. Albert mentioned the Vernon Park Baptist Church being started and it's built right by the cemetery and uh, the church cares for the cemetery. Uh, but we have five generations buried there. Uh, our great-great-grandfather, great-grandfather, grandfather and father and, and two brothers, three brothers. Uh, but the uh, cemetery is uh, it's, it's a community cemetery. It's under a big oak tree and spreads out from that. And uh, it, it's a quiet, peaceful place. But we, uh, we have been, got mem memories from there as well. Talking about the way things have changed. Um, when 
my earliest rem memories in that little $26 house, we did not have electricity and certainly didn't have a telephone and certainly didn't have a cell phone. But uh, I mean, nowadays, even these farmers, no matter where they go, they got a cell phone and call for help. But I worked many a day, all day long and never saw it. Got up before daylight, went to a field down by the swamp, spent the whole day and didn't see a soul, whether I was harvesting beans or digging in stumps for new ground or whatever. But that was just the way of life. And I remember when we got electricity in 1945. I remember when we got a telephone about 1950, one or two, somewhere along in there, I can't remember exactly. But um, another thing that's changed is we were talking about land. Daddy always invested in a lot of land, but uh, the place that Carol and I live now is just a quarter of a mile away. Uh, there was 118 acres of that place, but it, it first had been owned by my wife's family, and then the older generation died off, so they put it up for auction, and our parents bought it in 1941. And Dad bid, on a seal bid, he bid $31 and a quarter an acre, and he won it. The next bid was $25 an acre, but anyway, um, when I was in high school, there was a 40 became available that I told my dad I wanted to buy, so I went to Mr. Yeomans, Byron Yeomans that I'm named after, and borrowed the money to buy this 40 acres when I was 17 years old. I was at midterm of the 11th grade. and. $75 an acre or $3,000. And back before the, our economy crashed in 2007 or eight, some of our neighbors, less than two miles from that 40 acres that I paid 75 an acre for, there was, I think, 240 acres sold for 22,500 an acre. But then land prices, dipped. I mean, they fell off a cliff and then they've worked their way back up and they get on up in the neighborhood of what they were 15 years ago. But um, so many things have changed. But one thing I mentioned earlier that my, my dad and I, you could say I was totally a chip off of the old block when it came to livestock and he told people that he had one son he knew would keep things going when he was gone in terms of cattle. I've got some cattle that our great-grandmother, Joanna, they descended from some of her cattle and she died in 1938. So we just keep it going. I don't know who will do it, after, keep them going after I pass. But uh, anyway, we. There was one thing that my dad and I did not see eye to eye on. I mean, it was day and night, and that was sports. And I grew up going with Lawrence and Edward to see Foley football games. And in 1955, Foley had a really, really extremely good team. A lot of good players. My favorite was Bobby Lauder. He scored 24 touchdowns that year. But anyway, my goal was to play football. And my dad just, he wouldn't let Lawrence or Edward play. Edward really wanted to, but daddy just kept beating him down. But whenever it came to me, I disobeyed my parents, maybe more than once, but I know I disobeyed them once because in the spring training of the ninth grade, I didn't come home from school. I drew some equipment and practiced with the team. And I thought my career would last one day because I thought my dad would probably kill me when I got home, but he didn't, and I kept playing. I played three years of varsity football. It's interesting to me that my mother was from Fairhope, and for some reason, I don't know if I put extra effort into it or what, but my best games were against Fairhope through my career. But 
That's a picture of one night when I scored a touchdown against Fairhope. But <clears throat> this was our team in 1960, my senior year, and we only lost one game, and that was to Bayman Elliott. At least it was a county team. But, but anyway, this is a picture of homecoming court, and my wife and I both are in this picture. She was in the homecoming court, Carol DeVos. And anyway, I loved playing football, but I knew that my dad, I never brought up football to him, and he never, of course, brought it up to me. But we talked, when I was in presence, even when I come home from college or working in other counties, when I come home, we talk. My dad and I would talk about cows. We never talked about football. So, but all of it is part of my life, and I love every aspect. You may want to show the picture of Coach Jones because three of us played with Coach Jones in the stadium, Foley High School football stadium, is named after Coach Jones. And this was later years. It was really about five years ago, four years ago. And after 50 years that Coach Jones had retired, 50 years from his last game coaching in that stadium, we came together as a class of 1968 and the team of 1968 and others were involved and Coach Jones was able, it was hard, but it, it was, he made the effort and he was there for all of our pictures that gathered and he came to the game and he was there, but that was there and Sheldon played on the championship team and Sheldon can tell us a little about those that year and those years, Foley was so strong in the early 1960s. Yeah, Lord, he graduated in 61, and that team was really, really good. But the next year, a bunch of those te players that was on Claude's team came, were seniors. I was in 11th grade, and they were all really good players. There's a whole bunch of them. Kenny Stabler, everybody knows Kenny Stabler. He was the second string quarterback. Lester Smith was the first string quarterback that year, but we scored 433 points and the opponent scored six points. But, but one touchdown scored against us. That was Alba. Was and a young fellow named Glenn Hab scored that touchdown. I didn't remember he, his name. I, 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 I met see him, him years later and he really bragged about that and he embellished that story. <laughs> But anyway, I'm sure he did because he was the only it. one that scored anything he that year. It. But he, uh, I can still see it in my mind. Him, he got, he just took off running hard as he could run, and he got behind our defensive player and quarterback just throwed it as hard as he could throw it. And he, he scored. But then the first string, they scored on the second string team, and the first string got mad, and they all run back out there. And didn't let and blocked the extra point. They didn't even get hit. So the, the score was 433 to six. Starting with my senior year, Foley, in a five-year period, we won 47 games and only lost three. Three. And there's no, probably no streak like that in Alabama. Foley's in team in modern times have fallen on hard time, but I hope they can get back. But we, and if you take it to the sixth year, which Tim Russell was on that team. Our record for six years was 55 and five. Uh, that's it's quite I'm, strong. I was fortunate enough to be on that team. I wasn't a great player, but I was fortunate enough to be on there. I was number one in the state, and that's the only time that I know of that Foley was not, has been number one. We didn't have playoffs back then. They just, two papers, uh, Montgomery Herald, I think it was, Birmingham Times, they they picked who was number one in the state. I, back then, I wish we could have had playoffs, but we didn't. And I played on Coach Jones' last team in 1968. Didn't know it was his last. I don't know if he knew it. He may have. But that was the last team. So all those years from the early 1950s, Coach Jones was there thinking 55, 54, 55, all the way through 1968. And then Coach Lester Smith, as was mentioned, came and was the head coach just shortly thereafter. I think Coach Jones was head coach 14 or 16 years, but he, um, unfortunately, a lot of his players have passed on. But he died February the 3rd of 2021 and he was 94 years old, almost 95. But uh, I visited him often, and 
right up to his death, his mind was sharp, and he he could name you almost every player that ever played for him. He could tell you, even at that advanced age, what jersey number they wore. Mm -hmm. And you could ask him about a particular yeah. game, and he could tell you uh, who scored the touchdowns on our team, and he could tell you who on the opponent's team who scored the touchdown and how they scored it. He just had a mind that he, all that was stored in. You know what you're kind of saying is Coach Jones knew football about like Daddy knew cattle, mm -hmm. and then they did focus on it. I could tell you a funny story about Coach Jones, and I won't tell the long story. You don't have time, but we were actually gathered. Kenny Underwood was the mayor of the town, small town of Magnolia Springs, and Coach Jones was there in the short version. I'll leave the names out, but someone from another school was there, went up and introduced himself, and said, "I'm." I'm from Robert Still High School. Coach didn't go to Foley, but he said, oh, I know you called him my first name, Roger. And his wife stepped up and, he, and uh, she said, well, I was at Robert Still also, Coach. You wouldn't know me. And he said, yes, I know you. You were one of the cheerleaders, weren't you? I mean, like the details now. Yeah, yeah, Coach Jones's wife was not quite close enough to hear that, but it was interesting. And, but his mind was just so clear for all those years. Well, there's a couple other things, so much more that could be said. I wanted to go back to our church. The one that donated the land and their family was Albert Ross Lipscomb, our great uncle, my namesake. And that was important. And, and our mother and dad, you know, were very active in all those years. And mother played the piano. She played the piano, I think, around 40 years there at our church. So a lot of memories there, the cemetery, and two of you now three, the infant brother but three of the seven of us are there, but not really there, the bodies are there. One day we pray and the song was mentioned even today as we film and when the roll is called up yonder, that we be there and, and we have that chance, God's word. But there's a couple other things that come to my mind. I know we gotta wrap it up soon. There's so much more that could be said, but one is a boy state and that's American Legion, boy state across the state of Alabama. Four of us were selected to go through the years and Oswald didn't go because he was in FFA and it was a conflict of that week. So three of us went to Boyd State and, and Oswald was the fourth selected. But, but there were four of us who went to college. We went to Mango Springs School, went to Foley High School, and four of us, as I count, went to college, different degrees. One didn't go, Sheldon and Oswald didn't go, but with that farming, and that was a big part of the life, and that all changed. But I want to say one thing. The only person I've ever known in all my life, the only college classes he attended were the ones he taught. And I'll say it again. I'm sitting next to him. Is that bragging or what? But Oswald didn't go on to Auburn. He was applied and stayed in farm, kept the books for our farm. We were farming together. Went to computers, writing computer programs. And there came a day in the 70s and 1980s that... Auburn University Extension Service and many others in the ag community wanted farmers to know computers. Computers, I wouldn't be able to teach them much, but Oswald was asked and he did teach courses. And for those that had degrees, guess what? It was continuing education. So he didn't say it. He can look at the camera, I'll say it. But I wanted to say he was president of the National Honor Society in high school. And we all worked together and we all gifted in different ways, no doubt and he still helped us and helped so many ways. Most of us, if we ask him and if he gave us a bill for all the technology that he shared with us, we'd be kind of indebted we are. But that's, and I'll repeat it in a sentence, the only person I've ever known, the only college classes he ever attended were the ones he taught. And that's kind of a story that stands out today in my mind at least, and just to share it. I would just say that I've led a interesting life. I've had a lot of difficulties, a lot of health issues, but God's brought me through all of it. But it is a distinct and true honor to be a part of the family that I grew up in. I'm as proud as I can be of these three brothers and my older three brothers. Well, we just want to say thank you. We collectively as a family say thank you to the Baldwin County Commission for making this possible, not just for our family, but for our community. There's so much more that could be told. That's true of most families. But to be able to have this time together and to share and to be recorded for our children, grandchildren, perhaps for other family members, 
and there's so much more. We grew up, we grew up with the community here in a close-knit family, but extended community. And then beyond that, even within the Lipscomb family, if I may say, there's so much more to tell. We've rambled, if I can say it that way. Maybe we've told some of the stories in preparing for this. There's a lot more that could have been included, but we just know that we can't get all the stories in. But for this and what we've shared, we do express our appreciation. And again, as we think of this, it's important all around the county. We know some of the people I mentioned, and let me say it in the closing here, Mr. R.L. Smith meant so much. He was a principal of Foley High School, Mr. Oscar Rich, when I was there. But just the history and capturing the history of the county, we have so much. Here's our heritage, and not just Alabama, but Alabama and Baldwin County, Mobile County. This coastal area is so historic in many ways. I think there's five or six flags that fly over our county, our state. And not that we lived them, we're getting on up there but it is important and the more we know of our history, the more we know of our heritage, the more we know we've been blessed to live here in Alabama, in America, and specifically, and, and certainly here in Baldwin County. Thank you very much.